Income tax 2021-2022, reporting rental income expenses and losses part number one. Get ready to get refunds to the max, diving into income tax 2021-2022. Most of this information can be found in Publication 527, Residential Rental Property Tax Year 2021, IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. We're looking at the income tax formula focused on line one, income, noting we would have another schedule, basically an income statement with income and expenses, the expenses basically being deductions. The net then is what rolls into line one, income of the income tax formula, and eventually page one of the form. 1040. This is the Schedule E, basically the income statement schedule. We're focused on the rental real estate. So we're going to be continuing on here, reporting rental income, expenses, and losses. Figuring the net income or loss for residential rental activity may involve more than just listing the income and deductions on Schedule E, Form 1040. So the rental income gets a little bit confusing. You might ask yourself, why do I use a Schedule E as opposed to a Schedule C? They're both basically income statement types of schedules. The net then rolling in to page one of the Form 1040 eventually. But you'll note that we had some differences between the Schedule C and the Schedule E. Notable differences including like self-employment tax, for example, on the Schedule C oftentimes, which may not always be there with the reporting of the rental income. You've got the, the deductibility of... The qualified business income deduction and then on the Schedule C, which you don't see so much on the Schedule E. And you might have stuff on the Schedule E, which includes like passive activity uh, type of rules. So there's some differences between them. There could be some instances where you're going to actually be using a Schedule C when you're dealing with basically real estate situations. So there are activities that don't qualify to use Schedule E, such as when the activity isn't engaged in to make a profit or when you provide substantial services in conjunction with the property. So if it's not engaged in for profit, then you're talking about property that might not be like a rental type of property. It might be more of a, a, a personal property in that instance. And if you're talking about property that you provide for a lot of services for as well, then it looks like it's leaning more towards a business type of activity. That would be like if it was more like a hotel, for example, where you're providing services for the guests routinely instead of just providing a place of rental on a more of passive kind of situation then you would think it's likely that you might have to report that on the schedule c as opposed to the schedule e uh, there are also the limitations that may me to apply if you have a net loss on schedule e so note that the government is going to be skeptical of losses and they're even more skeptical of losses on the schedule e because losses you know the government's your silent partner but they want to take they want to be there when you make income, right? When you make a loss, they don't want to pay you for the loss that you have or allow you to take the loss on other incomes, although sometimes you can, but you can expect them to be more skeptical there. They're even more skeptical with losses with rental income because oftentimes when we engage in rental property, we're not in it just to get the rental income but we're also in it to basically have an increase in the value of the property, which is a more of a passive kind of activity. And so they, you can imagine they would be more skeptical that as we're just investing in the property for the property value to hopefully go up over time, we're writing off losses for rental losses. So, they're, so they might like limit the amount of losses more stringently on rental property than possibly on other types of businesses like a Schedule C type of business. So there are two. One, the limitation based on the amount of investment uh, you have at risk in your rental activity. And two, the special limits imposed on passive activities. So you may also have a gain or loss related to your rental property from a casualty or theft. This is considered separately from the income and expense information you report on Schedule E. So which forms to use then? Are we using the Schedule E? Are we using the Schedule C or what? The basic form reporting residential rental income and expenses is the Schedule E. So typically if we're thinking about they've got some other property 
possibly residential rental property, we, we would typically be thinking, okay, Schedule E would be the first form popping into the head as opposed to the Schedule E. However, don't use that schedule to report a not-for-profit activity. See uh, not rented for profit later in Chapter 4. So if it's a not-for-profit, that's going to stop us. We're going to have to do some more research on that and that we'll have to treat that differently. There are also other rental situations in which forms other than Schedule E would be used. Schedule E, Form 1040, if you rent buildings, rooms, or apartments, and provide basic services such as heat and light, trash collection, etc., you normally report your rental income on and expenses on Schedule E, Part 1. List your total income, expenses, and depreciation for each rental property, basically the income statement. Be sure to enter the number of fair rental and personal use days on line two. So that's going to help to determine whether it's a rental property like full-time rental property or how long it was a rental property. If you used it for personal use, then it gets a little bit more confusing for the allocation be between rental and personal use. If you have more than three rental or royalty properties, complete attach as many Schedule E uh, as are needed to separately list all the properties. So if we look at the Schedule E, the trustee Schedule E over here, then we've got these property names uh, A, B, C that we can list out the different properties. If we have more than three, then you're going to need more than one Schedule E in order to list out the properties over three that, uh, that you have. So however, fill in lines 23 uh, through 26 on only, only one Schedule E. So when we get down to the bottom line here, on the one Schedule E, we start to combine things together because you would think if they all qualify on the Schedule E kind of calculations that we could basically combine our, our total Schedule E incomes, possibly for use of passive act to try to figure out any kind of limitations we have, passive activity rules, loss limitations, and so on and so forth. So we can kind of combine them together at the bottom of the one Schedule E for that calculation. Uh, and that would be the general idea. So the figures on line 23A through 26 on the Schedule E should be the combined totals for all properties reported on your Schedule E. On Schedule E, page 1, line 18, enter the depreciation you are claiming for each property. You may also need to attach Form 4562 to claim some or all your depreciation. See Form 4562 later. So we're looking at the depreciation line here. Uh, depreciation, boom, form 4562, depreciation and amortization uh, may be necessary for the added detail related to it. And you can put that together in accordance and tax software, of course, helps us with that. Schedule E continued. If you have a loss from uh, your rental real estate activity, you may also need to complete one or both of the following forms. Forms 6198 at risk limitations. See at risk limitations later. Also see publication 925. Form 8582 passive activity loss limitations. See passive activity loss limitations later. So if we jump on over to the Schedule E here and we had a loss, we've got a huge expense here and so we've got a loss, then that loss, that's when the limitations might be applied to it. And you can look at some of these uh, other schedules that could be applied, including the passive activity loss to Form 8582. And here's Form uh, 6198 at risk limitations. So then uh, page two of Schedule E is used to report income or loss from partnerships, S corporations, estates, trusts, and real estate mortgage investment conduits. Uh, if you need to use page two of Schedule E and you have more than three rental or royalty properties, be sure to use page two of the same Schedule E you use to enter the combined totals for your rental activity on page one. So I uh, also include the amount from line 26, part one, and the total income or loss on line 41, part five. So Schedule E, Form 1040, we've got the Form 4562. You must complete and attach Form 4562 if you are claiming the following depreciation in your rental activity. So Form 4562, just to take a look at that, 4562 over here is the depreciation and amortization. We looked a little bit at the depreciation schedules in prior presentations. 
So then uh, we've got depreciation, including the special depreciation allowance on property placed in service during 2021, depreciation on listed property, such as a car, regardless of when it was placed in service. Otherwise, figure your depreciation on your own worksheet, which is basically those other worksheets. Typically, you're going to be using your software to help you out with those worksheets. Two, you don't have to attach these, these computations to your return, but you should keep them in your records for future reference. So they might not be an official form when we're actually looking at the worksheets for the depreciation calculations, but they're going to be critical and we're going to want those supporting schedules uh, in place in the event that there's questions about one of the most complex calculations we're doing here, that being the depreciation. So you may also need to attach form 4562 if you are claiming a section 179 deduction. That's kind of an accelerated uh, depreciation type of calculation where you get more depreciation up front. Amortizing costs that begin during 2021 or claiming any other deduction for a vehicle, including standard mileage rate or lease expenses. See publication 946 for information on preparing form 4562. Schedule C. Form 1040, profit or loss from business. So Schedule C isn't what we normally think of with the rental activity, but again, you could have some instances when in essence, it qualifies as more of a normal kind of business as opposed to the rental activities reported on Schedule Cs. And we had all the differences that comes in play when we're thinking about a Schedule C type of situation versus a Schedule E, even though they are both basically income statement type of schedules. So generally the Schedule C is used when you provide substantial services in conjunction with property or the rental in part of a trade or business as real estate dealer. So now you're, you're moving over to a Schedule C situation. Again, that means that you're gonna have to deal with self-employment tax. Most likely you got that business uh, deduction involved and, and so on and so forth, but you might not have as stringent kind of situations with regards to the uh, the loss limitations or the passive activity kind of stuff because you're active in the Schedule C uh, more specifically, you would think is the general, the general uh, assumption. Providing substantial services. So what does that mean? If you provide substantial services that are primarily for your tenant's convenience, such as regular cleaning, changing linen, or maid services, you report your rental income and expenses on Schedule C. So you're acting more kind of like a hotel kind of situation as opposed to just providing a place for someone to rent and then just kind of keeping up with that place but not you're not really doing you know the day-to-day -day services on it you know like changing the sheets and whatnot but uh, you might uh, you might fix the the roof if it was leaking for example if it was a rental so so use form uh, 1065 us return of partnership income if your rental activity is a partnership so if it's a partnership of course then you use the partnership form uh, to, to do that so you can allocate then the income from the partnership 1065 form to the individual owners more than one of them two or more owners that would then flow through with a k1 to the forms 1040s so including a partnership with your spouse unless it is a qualified rent uh, joint venture now when you get to a partnership situation with your spouse uh, it gets a little bit confusing uh, on it because you got to think about well now you got two people that are involved in this venture but they're really taxed as one person basically for federal income taxes but you still kind of have to break them out as two people at least for the allocation of the self-employment tax which is going to be applicable to the schedule c business because now you've got this self-employment tax which is basically applied per person and so you got to figure out some way how are you going to treat with the partnership that is a, a marital couple so in any case, substantial. we talked more about that when we talked about the Schedule C business in general, different options for a marital couple on it. We might look at it a little bit more in depth here, but substantial services don't include the furnishing of heat and light, cleaning of public areas, trash collection, etc. For more information about that, you can see publication 334, Tax Guide for Small Business. Also, you may have to, have to pay self-employment tax on your rental income using Schedule SE Form 1040. Well, that's no good. Why do I have to do that? I don't want to do that. Yeah, that's that's what happens when it's a Schedule C. But in any case, self-employment tax for a discussion of uh, substantial services, see real estate rents in Chapter 5 of Publication 334. Qualified joint venture. So if you and your spouse each materially participate, see marital participation 
uh, under passive activity limits later as the only members of a jointly owned and operated real estate business and you file a joint return for the tax year, uh, you can make a joint election to be treated as qualified joint venture instead of a partnership. Now that could be easier to do because if you do a partnership, then you got to file a separate tax return and then have the K-1s to flow through. That's generally going to cost more and be more of a, a problem or a pain. If you can have a qualified joint venture, possibly, that would be an easier type of thing uh, to deal with. This election, in most cases, won't increase the total tax owed on the joint return, but it does give each of you credit for Social Security earnings on which retirement benefits are based uh, and Medicare coverage is your rental income is subject to self-employment tax. So if it's reported on the Schedule C, it might be subject to the self-employment tax. That's usually, that's kind of where we get this, the the problem <laughs> that would be involved in there because you got to allocate the self-employment tax to the proper spouse uh, so that they get the proper coverage for the benefits that they'll be receiving at the retirement time when they're going to be receiving benefits. So if you make this election, you must report rental real estate income on Schedule E or Schedule C if you provide substantial services. Uh, you won't be required to file Form 1065, the partnership return, for any, uh, any year the election is in effect. Rental real estate in, uh, income generally isn't included in net earnings from self-employment subject to self-employment tax and is generally subject uh, and is generally subject to the passive activity limits. So if you and your spouse filed a form 1065 for the year prior to the election, the partnership terminates at the end of the tax year immediately preceding the year the election takes effect. So, so for more information on qualified joint ventures, you can go to the irs.gov website, qualified joint ventures, QJV. Uh,